thank you very much for the invitation for the for this conference to celebrate Tilbo's work. work. Um, Tilbo has worked on many aspects of gravity. We just heard uh, of his impact uh, on measurements. So from his work, works ranges from very concrete, uh, you know, astrophysical observations to more fundamental aspects of gravity. Uh, such as the behavior near singularities or the interrelation between gravity and string theory. So my my talk today will actually be related to a, a paper that uh, Tilbo wrote uh, on self-gravitating strings and black holes and the connection between uh, strings and black holes. Um, <clears throat> and it's based on a paper we recently wrote uh, with uh, Yimin Chen and Ed Witten uh, exploring further that, that theme. Um, so in we will consider here black holes in weakly coupled uh, string theory. And uh, in that theory, when the black hole size is close to the string scale, they are supposed to turn into highly excited strings. Um, and we'll discuss some aspects of these transitions. So that, that's what the talk will be about. And surprisingly, we'll find that the situation is different uh, depending on the detailed type of string theory we are dealing with. Um, so throughout the talk, we'll be considering uh, what's called the weakly coupled string theory. So where the interaction between strings are, is, is relatively weak. So in those theories have a scale, which is the set by the tension of the string. Uh, we can choose units over so that is one. Uh, we'll choose it to be one in some of the formulas. And in the Newton constant on the other hand is set by the string interaction scale and the string coupling and will be, um, very small, so the Planck length would be much smaller than the string length. Uh, and the string length is at this, the length at which uh, the Einstein description of the system ceases to be valid. So for distances bigger than the string length, we can apply ordinary gravity. And for distances smaller than that, uh, gravity, is, gravity is modified by string theory, but it's still weakly coupled. Um, and we, we can consider two types of uh, string theory, it's so-called type two string theory or the heterotic superstring. The two means that there are two supersymmetries in 10 dimensions and in the heterotic there is one supersymmetry in 10 dimensions. And we will uh, mostly be discussing uh, problems in four dimensions where we have uh, four, compact, uh, four non-compact dimensions and six uh, compact dimensions. Um, now let's uh, introduce the various actors in this story. So the first uh, is uh, a highly excited string. So this is simply a string that is oscillating, uh, an oscillating string uh, with a lot of energy. So a large amount of energy compared to its uh, tension. And such strings uh, have some entropy, which comes from all the possible ways in which it can be oscillating. And they have the peculiar feature that the entropy is uh, linear in the mass. So it's proportional uh, to the mass uh, with a proportionality constant, um, which is so further again, the, the string scale. And we can think of this proportionality constant as a certain inverse temperature. It's sometimes called the Hagerdon inverse temperature. Um, and this is an interesting temperature because if you have the thermodynamics of uh, these strings, this thermodynamics is well defined only for temperatures less than uh, this particular uh, temperature or inverse temperatures, of course, beta bigger than beta H because, um, because in, the <clears throat> in the partition function, we have a factor of minus beta M uh, from the energy. And then from the entropy, we get a factor of beta H M. So only for beta bigger than beta H, uh, this will be convergent as we sum over the very massive string states, okay? So there is this uh, maximal temperature uh, after which that we have in uh, string theory. Um, then uh, we have also black holes. And of course, uh, you're very familiar with black holes. I don't need to tell you what they are, uh, but in this context uh, of string theory, these black hole solutions are well-defined as long as the Schwarzschild radius is uh, very large compared to the string scale. And you can compute the, the first, the corrections uh, relative to that large limit. So when R, there is an expansion in terms of the string length over the Schwarzschild radius, and the first uh, terms in that expansion were computed. So uh, the, the corrections due to string theory. And however, we can wonder what happens when they approach uh, the size of the string there, 
we cannot really compute it uh, perturbatively. We have to do something better. Now, another indication of what might happen is uh, based on uh, looking at the uh, entropies as a function of the mass for both the black hole and the strain. We just saw that the uh, free strain has a, an entropy which is linear in the mass, and I plotted here in uh, blue. Um, on the other hand, uh, for a four-dimensional black hole, the uh, entropy goes like the, the area, and um, that's uh, quadratic in the size, and the mass goes like the size, and therefore the entropy is uh, quadratic in the mass. So we have a curve like this. And so the, the curve really, each of the curves can only be trusted, for example, the black hole curve can be trusted for very large masses. But if we naively extrapolate the curve, we see that they, it crosses the extrapolation of the free string curve. Also, the free string curve cannot be, um, cannot be trusted for very large masses. It, it's valid for masses where you can neglect the self-gravity of the string. But if you naively extrapolate that, you see that these two curves cross. So this has led to the idea that perhaps uh, what happens is that uh, we just simply need to pick up the Config for a given mass, we need to pick up the configuration that has the largest entropy. And that when the black hole is small, it will turn somehow into this uh, highly oscillating strain. Um, and this point where the extrapolated curves uh, meet was sometimes called the correspondence point. So where the two give uh, the same mass and the same entropy. Um, so the question we'll try to address is whether there is a smooth uh, transition between the black holes and these highly excited strings. And one motivation for revisiting this question is that uh, in the string picture, the microstates are explicit. So we can understand that the entropy comes from the various states of this oscillating strain. Uh, on the other hand, uh, in the black hole, uh, what the microstates are is not completely obvious. Um, and all, but on the other hand, the black hole has some interior, uh, but the, in the string picture, there's nothing analogous to that. Um, so if one understood this transition better, maybe one can understand how uh, these uh, microstates uh, are represented on the black hole side. So this is just some long-term motivation. We are not going to answer this question, uh, but this is uh, some motivation in the back of our minds. So um, we've we seen this curve. This is the curve we said, we said before. We said that there are some modifications here in the black hole due to string corrections. And I'm now going to discuss some modifications uh, from, the, from the string side. First, uh, we need to discuss a little bit uh, some comments about uh, string theory at finite temperature. Um, so if uh, you are at finite temperature, then a natural way to think about that is to compactify the Euclidean time direction. So you go to Euclidean time, and then you consider Euclidean time to be compact with some length, and the length of uh, the Euclidean time circle is the inverse temperature. Now, in a situation like that, in uh, string theory, there is a new feature that appears, which is the fact that a string can wind around this uh, Euclidean time circle. And so there is uh, there's that particular string, sometimes called the winding mode. And uh, the mass of uh, the, the mass square of this string well, has a piece that is proportional to the square of the radius. This is, would be the naive expression for the mass, just the, the mass is just the tension times the length. But there is a correction due to the quantum uh, fluctuations that is negative, so some kind of Casimir energy on the surface of the string. And that leads to uh, this formula, where whatever that energy is, that depends on the number of ways in which the string can oscillate, is some, some constant. And that constant determines this uh, inverse higher than, higher than temperature or maximal temperature. Um, so when, um, when this mode becomes massless, that's when we are reaching uh, this, um, this special temperature. If, if beta is bigger than, than that special value, than beta h, then this uh, mode is massive and the whole partition function is well defined. If uh, on the other hand, beta is smaller, then uh, this mod will be tachyonic and uh, the, the partition function, the, the fluctuations around this, so, so, and then the solution becomes unstable. So thermally reasonable solutions are situations where uh, beta is uh, bigger than beta h. So we're always going to be considering that situation. And if we think of dimensionally reducing uh, the higher dimensional theory um, on this circle, then uh, in the extended dimensions, we can write down an action 
for this winding mode, we can think of this winding mode as a field that has some action with a particular mass uh, given by this. Um, now, in addition, uh, we can have uh, some gravitational uh, interactions. And so this mode can have some self interactions. You could also have a chi to the fourth term and so on. But it turns out that the most important interaction is the one mediated by massless fields. And uh, that is actually gravity will be the most important one. And it is attractive and it is. Uh, it gives rise, if we integrate the gravity out, it gives rise to um, a term that uh, basically a negative term in the sense that, well, that's just the familiar effect that uh, the gravitational uh, potential is negative. Um, and when beta is very close to beta h, this mode is light, and we can approximate this whole discussion in string theory by a simple discussion, sim much simpler discussion that involves uh, gravity in uh, one less dimension. So gravity plus this extra field in one, one less dimension. And this approximation leads to an interesting solution. So that is a solution of uh, this action. And uh, that's a solution uh, first found by Horowitz and Polchinski. And it was the subject also of this paper that I mentioned of Damour and Veneziano who analyzed the sort of the, the, the same configuration uh, from the point of view of what from a more Hamiltonian point of view and giving a real time representation of the solution. So this is a solution that is localized in, let's say three spatial dimensions. Uh, so we have the Euclidean time circle, uh, that's uh, relatively small, but then we have the three uh, spatial dimensions and we get a localized profile for the winding mode where it's spherically symmetric. And this is roughly a, a profile of the winding mode. And it describes a self-gravitating string in thermodynamic equilibrium. So it's a kind of string star. So it's, um, it's at finite temperature and self-gravitating. Um, now you can solve that equation and find how, uh, how the size uh, behaves. And it turns out that uh, as the mass increases, the size of the object decreases. Um, and, uh, and well, then the and actually, the, the mass is proportional to the deviation from this uh, higher than temperature. So this size has to be uh, larger than one for us to be trust the gravity approximation. So this uh, description is only true um, somewhat close to the uh, higher than temperature. And for uh, situations where g, new, g squared times the mass is uh, relatively small, so that uh, this size is large. So. And so this implies that uh, this description is valid uh, below that correspondence point we were talking about before. Uh, for masses below that, uh, the mass corresponding to the cor the, that correspondence point. Now, this is a classical solution. And something interesting about this classical solution is that uh, it leads to a non-zero entropy. So um, normally, classical solutions uh, don't have an entropy. Uh, an exception to that is a black hole, for example, that has it's a classical solution with an entropy, and that's due to the fact that uh, the circle, the Euclidean time circle shrinks at the horizon. But in this case, uh, there is also classical entropy that comes from a different mechanism. It comes from the fact that the mass square of the, this winding mode depends explicitly on the temperature. And so if you take uh, the usual derivative of the free energy or the, log the logarithm of the free, yeah, the logarithm of of the partition function or the classical action that is given by the classical action, uh, then um, we find that uh, because the fields are obeying the equations of motion, the only dependence on the temperature comes from uh, the explicit dependence of the temperature of this uh, mass term. And that leads to a relatively simple expression for the entropy, which is just given by integrating this, uh, this winding mode profile. So this winding mode profile square roughly gives us the um, amount of uh, string strings we have in each uh, position in space. And when we do this, then we get uh, that to lead in order, it gives uh, an entropy, which is uh, beta times m, uh, so proportional to, to the mass uh, and uh, with uh, some, some sublimit correction. So this is similar to, and beta is close to beta h. So this is similar to the entropy we, we get from the free string point of view. So this is consistent with the picture uh, that this solution is describing an oscillating string uh, after taking into account the gravitational uh, self-interactions. 
Um, so briefly mention a couple of things about the geometry of the Euclidean black hole. Uh, so we have the Euclidean time circle that uh, shrinks to zero at the horizon. Um, now, when we have a black hole, we can also have a condensed of this uh, winding mode. So if you try to calculate uh, what this profile of this winding mode is at some distance from the black hole, it can be calculated in terms of a string ball sheet that wraps the horizon. And this calculation is going to give you something uh, of this form that is exponentially small, um, especially if the temperature is, uh, is, is very low, uh, as it needs to be in order for us to try to trust the black hole. So the winding mode is present, and um, this uh, implies that, uh, in particular, that the, the following thing. So if you look at the circle far away, uh, there is a symmetry and the translations on the circle. But in string theory, this is also a symmetry associated to winding the string around the circle. But that symmetry is broken by, uh, the, by the fact that the circle shrinks, and you can unwind that, uh, that mode. So, and also, it's represented by the fact that we have a non-zero winding condensate. And we can think of this as uh, a thermal atmosphere of string. So this is the Euclidean picture. But in Lorentzian signature, we should think of the black hole as containing a thermal atmosphere of string. So this is really the Hawking uh, effect, uh, but for, for strings that are bound near the horizon. Um, and this effect gives a classical contribution to the entropy, which formally is of order 1 over g string squared. But it's not really calculable, at least in, to my knowledge, because it's concentrated near the horizon where we cannot uh, do this calculation, honestly. Um, so notice that the winding symmetry is spontaneously broken both on the black hole phase and also in the highly uh, excited string phase. So in both cases, there is some kind of winding condensate. And this is consistent with uh, the idea that they might be continuously connected. So um, the idea is that if we have this horizontal axis represents the, the inverse temperature beta of the, black, of the system. Uh, for large beta, we have the black hole description. And then uh, for beta, which is very close to this uh, lowest possible, to, to this po lowest possible value of beta, uh, we have the horowitz polchinski description. And the question is whether there is some interpolating solution uh, between these two. Um, now, both, both configurations have a non-zero classical entropy. And so we can ask about this interpolating solution. So how we would find the interpolating sol solution? This is a classical solution in uh, string theory. And it's described by a two-dimensional conformal field theory. So the two-dimensional conformal field theory describes the string wall sheet moving in this, uh, this space-time. Um, here, we are, we're in four dimensions. So we are thinking that we are always talking about the, the conformal field theory, which describes those four dimensions. And there is a separate one that describes the motion of the string in the six dimensions. And this extra factor, we always uh, keep it fixed. The six extra dimensions could be uh, torus or simple circles, so or it could be something more complicated. But uh, we're only focusing uh, throughout the rest of the discussion on this four-dimensional part. And so we expect that there should be one, uh, only one parameter beta that, that, as, that we vary, and we go between these two. So that uh, would be the naive expectation, and that's uh, what we would like to understand. And the, the answer for the type 2 string theory is that uh, such, such, in, such interpolation as a classical string solu solution uh, cannot happen. And um, the argument is the following. So consider an we are going to consider a certain, the main problem is that we will not be able to construct this uh, solution explicitly. Uh, so we are going to simply argue that uh, there, it cannot be continuously connected by finding some invariant that we can compute something that we expect that should remain invariant as we change beta. So uh, there are quantities in, in these two dimensional field theories that are invariant under deformation. And one such quantity, did, yeah, I should mention that the, these theories, these Welsh theories are super symmetric. Uh, so because we are talking about the super string and a candidate invariant is the so-called Witten index of this uh, super symmetric Welsh CFT. So that is defined to be uh, the partition function of the Welsh theory on a cylinder, um, inserting minus one to the F where F counts the fermion number so this is a quantity that uh, is uh, where bosons and fermions cancel when they are they have non-zero energy, 
but when you consider uh, states with zero energy, you can have a non-zero value for this. So it's roughly counting the number of bosonic minus, minus fermionic uh, ground states of the system. Uh, in the string language, uh, they are also counting the they are counting the number of Ramon Ramon ground states. So on the horowitz polchinski side, we find that this index is zero uh, because we can consider a flat uh, target space. Um, it can be deformed to a flat target space. Um, and on the horowitz on the black hole side, we find that the index is actually two. Now this index. Uh, is for, for the situation that uh, the field theory is described by a so-called sigma model that is a map from the two-dimensional world sheet to some target space, uh, then the index is equal to the Euler characteristic of the target space. And the Euler characteristic of the black holes, the topological invariant, is actually two. And since they are different, uh, they, there cannot be a continuous connection. So the, the simplest possibility might be that uh, at some point in the middle, uh, the um, there are some uh, some region of the geometries becoming um, strongly coupled, so that the string coupling is becoming large in some region of the geometry. That might be what happens, but maybe there is a first order transition. We don't really know exactly what would happen in this case. Now, in this uh, heterotic uh, string theory, the story is slightly different. So now we have a Welsh theory that has only uh, right moving supersymmetry, but no, not left moving supersymmetry. So, um, and in this case, the index can uh, be computed and it's actually equal to zero on both sides. So the index again is uh, computing the number of uh, so-called Ramon ground states of a system, or really the difference between the Ramon ground states with positive and negative parity. And because both uh, both configurations are parity invariant, we get uh, we get that it is zero. Uh, another known invariants are also the same, um, and in fact uh, there is a, a so-called linear sigma model analysis which suggests that they are continuously connected. So I, I will explain what this is. Um, so in situations where we cannot explicitly construct the conformal field theory. We can view the conformal field theory as the infrared limit of a simpler theory. So we start uh, with a theory involving uh, free fields, and which is not conformal, just the well, the theory of free fields, and then we add a potential. So this theory with the potential is not uh, conformal invariant, but the idea is that the infrared uh, it will become conformal invariant. I'll try to explain that a little in, in just a second. So in this particular case, uh, there is uh, some supersymmetric action involving superfields that we can write down. I will not discuss it in detail, but it involves a certain function of some superfields. Um, and by the time you go to the component uh, component action, uh, you end up uh, with a potential, which is the square of that function that appears in the Lagrangian. So in other words, uh, supersymmetry implies that the potential should be the square of some function. Now for our problem, what we want to do is we want, uh, we are in four dimensions and we have, uh, we're going to introduce uh, five fields. So we have, um, and which are in two groups. So we have a group of three and a group of two, and we're going to pick up the function that has uh, this particular form. And this uh, is chosen uh, for the following reason, uh, because now when we set W equal to zero, then, uh, for example, we can solve for x squared, and uh, we can think of so x. So this formula is saying that for each value of y, uh, we have some value for x squared. So we can think of this as a, a circle. So y where x were two dimensions, and when we set the square to be something, we have a circle. And this you can think of as the a point in in R three, for example. So depending on um, on the sign of uh, this uh, some this, some combination of these coefficients. So for example, if b minus c over a is bigger than zero, then we can set y equal to zero here. That's the lowest value that uh, the radius can have. And that value will be positive. So in this case, the radius of the circle never shrinks in this uh, three-dimensional space. And we have a solution which has the topology of the horowitz polchinski type. On the other hand, if the sign is opposite, then uh, there is a minimum value of y uh, where at which the circle shrinks to zero size. And the solution has the, the this space where w is equal to zero 
has the uh, black hole topology. So this is just one equation over five variables. So the space of solutions of W equal to zero uh, is a four dimensional space with these two topologies depending on the parameters that we choose. Um, so the idea is that as we vary the parameters, the classical vacuum manifold, so that what, what we get by setting W equal to zero is similar either to the, to the horowitz polchinski or to the black hole topology. So the idea is that it's the following. So we start with a theory with three fields uh, plus a potential. And then we look at the classical man vacuum manifold given by W equal to zero. And um, this is some curved space and that will not by itself define a conformal field theory. So in fact, in fact, there will be a flow to a conformal field theory that will adjust the metric on this space to, uh, to be Ricci flat, for example, or to, have, to solve the appropriate equations. We did not analyze this step in detail, uh, but after that step, we are supposed to flow to a, a true conformal field theory in the infrared, and that's the solution uh, we are looking for. So this is just a mechanism for thinking about the solution and for studying properties of a solution which we cannot explicitly find. Now in the UV theory, we had three parameters, this A, B, and C. In the exact infrared theory, in this conformal field theory, we expected just one marginal parameter, which is beta, um, but we also expect one relevant deformation of this CFT uh, because that in principle throughout this process should be fine-tuned. And the reason is that both the black hole and the HP solutions have uh, one negative mode when we think about off-shell deformations. And uh, so we expect that the third parameter should be irrelevant. So no matter what its value is, we should flow to the CFT so that we have to adjust only one parameter. Um, now, the interesting aspect here is that uh, nothing special happens when um, this is equal to zero in the original here in the, in the original uh, UV theory. So there is no new branch uh, happening there. So we expect that the flow to the infrared theory does not need to show any surprise. So, um, so that is at this intermediate stage, the two theories are continuously connected. Now, when would they flow all the way to the infrared? It might be the case uh, that they are continuously connected, but what we are presenting is not a proof, it's just an indication. It could happen that after flowing for a long time, they become again disconnected. Now, this business of the linear sigma model can also be applied for the type two theory. Um, and well, in view of time, maybe I'll, uh, I'll skip this discussion. Um, and uh, only mention that uh, this fact that the two solutions are different in the type two theory is also related to the fact that D brains are different on the horowitz polchinski and this black hole side. So, um, so on this HP side, uh, we can have a D zero brain, so that it, it, a particle, uh, D particle. Um, but on the black hole side, the same uh, charge is carried by some electric field in the black hole and there is no explicit particle. Um, okay, maybe I'll, well, I'll just briefly mention that uh, everything that we said was for neutral black holes, but there's a special kind of charged black holes um, that for which this is discussion also arises. Uh, also, also is. So the conclusions are that we discussed the possible connection between the black hole and the self-gravitating string of Horowitz and Polchinski that was also further studied by Damour and Veneziano. And for the type two case, we showed that the two could not be continuously connected at classical solutions, but for the heterotic case, they could be connected. And there are many questions for the future, whether we can say a little more about the CFT at intermediate values of beta. Um, notice that this description is just really the description of the analog of the Schwarzschild solution in string theory. So the, the Schwarzschild solution was found one year later after GR was invented, uh, was discovered. Uh, but uh, in string theory, well, the, the rules of string theory were already set up uh, you know, 50 years ago, but we don't have uh, the analog of the simplest spherically symmetric uh, non-trivial solution. And that's what we've been talking about today. Um, and we can track the picture of the microstates through this intermediate region. Um, so, well, so this should have been a question. So the question is whether we can do that. Um, and I think we haven't explained why, from a more conceptual way, why the heterotic and type two pictures are different. So this is still a puzzle. Um, but well, I'd like to finish uh, wishing happy birthday to Tibol again. Other questions from the audience?
in short questions, or is there from the net question? No question. Maybe Tibo has a question. Just a short, uh, a short comment. All the solutions you are talking about here, the transition is uh, Euclidean solutions, not yes, yes, yes. Time. Yes, yes, yes. We consider the Euclidean case because it's simpler, and in particular, in four dimensions, the situation is particularly simple. Uh, but yeah, so we, of course, uh, understanding the problem in Lorentzian signature is also it's, interesting. It's it's not just a big quotation. You want us to if you um, have this solution explicitly? Yeah. So um, in principle, the so that, that horowitz polshinsky solution we discussed. Has, uh, has this winding mode, and the meaning of the winding mode wave function is not clear in Lorentzian signature. Okay. And um, however, if you cal calculate the stress tensor of this uh, solution, you can continue that stress tensor. And as you showed in your paper with uh, Veneziano, you can interpret that as a gas of strings. And so you could, you could directly think about the solution in Lorentzian signature but you wouldn't have this uh, winding mode profile. And I think it's an interesting question. I probably should have put it in the questions of exactly what the interpretation of this winding mode profile is in, yeah. in Lorentzian okay. symmetry. Thank you. Sure. Okay. Uh, there is one question more. Yeah. Yeah. So, if it's a self-gravitating strings you wrote, and there's this, uh, uh, you use some kind of homogeneous operator, beta, del, del, beta. So it's kind of automatic or it's kind of, or you put it by hand, uh, the action, the self-gravitating strings? Um, yeah, so there was an action that involved the winding mode. So that action is derived uh, with the assumption that this winding mode is uh, has low energy in the three-dimensional theory. So we started with a four-dimensional theory with the Euclidean circle, when the circle has a special value close to this uh, Hagedon inverse temperature. Then there is this winding mode, which is very light. And so then it's included as an extra light field. And so all we wrote was just the quadratic action with the mass term. Is that the question you were asking? Or? Yeah, it's uh, okay. maybe. Okay, it's, so we'll this time. Okay, good. Thank you. It's fine. It's fine. Yeah, it's fine. It's agreed. <laughs> so uh, thanks again. <laughs> okay, thank you very much and happy birthday again. <laughs>